If you've watched my previous videos, you may be aware that I really enjoy biopics. The idea of an actor portraying someone beloved from culture or history on screen has always been really fascinating to me. The physical and vocal choices of the actor, the elements of the story the writer chooses to include or not include, how well the look of the film reflects the time period, and most importantly, what the filmmakers want to say about this person or people. I even love the cheap TV movie biopics from the 90s and 2000s where an unknown actor has the impossible task of trying to make us believe they're really Madonna or Princess Diana or the Beatles, usually through the use of bad wigs, bad accents and flimsy storytelling. But then we have the more prestige biopics, the big budget films that seek to tell the story of a cultural icon in a more, hopefully, distinct and artistically innovative way. Of these, none are more ubiquitous than the music biopic the ones about composers, recording artists, and bands that changed the face of popular music forever. One that stands out to me is Amadeus, the epic 1984 film about Mozart and how he eclipses the musical talent of fellow composer and narrator of the movie, Salieri. The film is packed to the brim with lavish production, wonderful dialogue, incredible performances, and a grandiose story that dives into the minutia of the legend himself and explores the way his unprecedented talent and creative genius disrupted the world of Western classical music forever. Although a lot of it is fabricated and dramatized to create a more compelling story, it's extremely imaginative at capturing the essence of Mozart and is definitely one of my favorites. But for the most part, when we talk about music biopics, our mind goes to 20th century recording artists. The emergence of these biopics from the last 20 years or so typically follow a rags to riches, cradle to grave formula that films such as Ray and Walk the Line helped establish. These movies about the lives of Ray Charles and Johnny Cash respectively were celebrated for how the uncanny performances from the two leads gave us a better sense of the artists as individuals. They also managed to nab a few Oscars, including a Best Actor win for Jamie Foxx. In 2007, after several other music biopics cemented the reliable yet increasingly tired formula, Thank you, life. Thank you, love. Jake Kazdan and Judd Apatow made the film Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story, a parody of the music biopic, which also happens to be one of my all-time favorite comedies. Walk Hard takes all the tropiest elements of these movies, including the troubled childhood, the unsatisfied first wife, the winning over of the stuffy music producer, the big hit that launches them to fame, usually through montages, drugs, activism, rehab, and lots more. All of these elements are so accurately portrayed, but what makes this a perfectly executed spoof is the look and self-seriousness of the movie. It's so funny watching everyone utter such silly dialogue delivered completely straight. What about my dreams? Edith, I told you I can't build your candy house. It will fall down, the sun will melt the candy, it won't work. It will if it never rains. Which, along with how the look of the film is identical to the other prestige biopics, makes the self-important tone that much more hilarious. After Walk Hard, there needed to be a complete restructuring of the music biopic. Those cookie cutter elements just wouldn't cut it anymore now that we'd see them pulled off, often more successfully, in a very silly parody film. And to be fair, two other music biopics from the same year as Walk Hard really took a creative risk with a more art house approach. I'm referring to I'm Not There about Bob Dylan and Control about Ian Curtis of Joy Division. These two films contain elements of the traditional music biopic biopic, but overall the style of each of these is unique and, like the artists they're portraying, offer us something artistically fresh. But in recent years, we've seen a resurgence of the music biopic as blockbusters, with the likes of Bohemian Rhapsody, Straight Outta Compton, and Rocket Man. Now, these three films are by no means of equal footing. I would say Straight Outta Compton and Rocket Man at least attempt some fresh and exciting storytelling elements, but for the most part, they follow the now extremely tired formulaic beats that Walk Hard parodied more than 10 years prior. Bohemian Rhapsody is the biggest culprit of this. Seriously, it was like it was copying off War Card's homework, but it didn't realize it was a joke assignment. A film about one of the boldest and most artistically unique musical geniuses is reduced to a movie that plays it super safe and offers us nothing. With its bland look, choppy editing, lifeless character portrayals, and sanitized script, this film is nothing more than a bullet point list of Queen's story that fails to actually say anything substantial about the band or Freddie Mercury himself. I could go on with all the issues I have with this film, but I'm not here to bash any more movies. I spent my last video doing that. Oh, and just real quick, 84% of you who watch my videos haven't subscribed. What? If this is the third video you watched and you haven't subscribed, come on. You gotta do it, man. It's, it's the best way. And if the subscriber count goes up, the views go up, which means I'll get more time to spend working on videos for you in the future. Oh.
Sorry, back to the video. Today I'd like to discuss what I think is the best music biopic, a movie that I think should be the blueprint for how these kinds of films are made in future. I'm of course referring to Love and Mercy, about the life, love, and genius of Brian Wilson. There are so many things that I love about this film. The look of it, the performances, the use of sound, but something that makes it a truly great film is all the ways in which it defies the standard biopic formula. What I'm referring to is an issue I have with these kinds of films where they cram too many events into a single two hour movie. Most people who have biopics made about them have led extraordinary lives, often over the course of several decades. So do you try and make a film that's representative of their whole life to get a broader picture of them? Or do you try and focus on a particular time period or event that shaped them into the person we know them as today? Love and Mercy, co-written by Oren Moverman, who also co-wrote I'm Not There, doesn't go for the usual cradle-to-grave formula, where we would see Brian as a little boy learning harmonies with his brothers and ending it with, like, a Beach Boys reunion concert in 2012. No, instead, the film focuses on the two most consequential periods of his life. The creative explosion of the mid-60s, where he made the groundbreaking Pet Sounds album, and the complicated 80s, where he meets his future wife, Melinda, but is under the conservatorship of unconventional psychotherapist Eugene Landy. Paul Dano plays the 60s Brian, and John Cusack plays the 80s Brian. I think this approach works much better. By honing in on these two periods, we can take our time on each and get a better sense of the man as an artist and human being. Whilst it can be tempting to want to see the highlights of every point of the person's life, that's when you start running into the Wikipedia problem. This is where, by virtue of wanting to cram in as much information as possible, the film begins to read like a Wikipedia entry for that person, a checklist, as opposed to a film with a clear intention with what it's trying to say about that person. It needs a point of view to explore, and if you're just rattling off the hits, the point of view just becomes, wow, what an incredible person with an incredible life. It's the difference between between the movie Jobs and Steve Jobs. The former is perhaps one of the biggest culprits of the Wikipedia problem, looking at Steve Jobs' life as a whole, which, while fun, is not really saying much else. Whereas the latter is set during three specific product launches in his career. And from those three consequential moments, we learn more about the man and his legacy than what is attempted in the two-dimensional Ashton Kutcher version. In the case of Brian Wilson, the Pet Sounds and Smile era is the most significant of his entire career, bridging the summer fun Beach Boys with a period of Brian's psychological decline. Whilst the 80s era and what happened with Eugene Landy is not widely known at all. Love and Mercy juxtaposes this famous period with this unknown period, allowing the audience to see both the joyous creation of a beloved album, but it also means they'll learn new details on a complicated and very private part of his life, giving the biopic more depth, credibility, and a bigger reason for audiences to go see the film in general. <laughs> We do get to see other periods from Brian's life, but it's done in a far more effective way. The early 60s Beach Boys, the fun in the sun driving cars around Beach Boys, is probably the version of the band that most of us know best. So instead of making that the whole first act of the film, we instead get a tight two and a half minute montage of it during Love and Mercy's opening credit sequence. It's a fun collection of grainy clips of them playing live, doing promo shoots on the beach, recording in the studio, all the while some of their biggest early hits play over the top. These clips, which were shot on Super 16mm film, really do look like genuine archival footage, and they serve as a convenient reminder of what was happening with Brian and the Beach Boys up to this point, and is all we need to continue the story. These warm, nostalgic tones are then contrasted immediately with the introduction of the 80s period, which is far more clinical, using a palette of whites, blues, and greys, giving us a minimal, almost blank aesthetic to reflect Brian's cleaned up appearance and life Lifestyle. These are shot on 75mm film and is juxtaposed again with a mid-60s California pool party sequence shot on 35mm film. The warm, woody tones and bright, colourful vibe is the perfect aesthetic for Brian's creative masterpiece to take shape. Along with the filmic quality adding to the look of the period, the incredible recreation of Brian's Beverly Hills pad from the 60s using another similar property nearby pulls you further into the world without it looking like a dressed up soundstage. They also shot in the actual studios that the Beach Boys recorded Pet Sounds and Smile, which really adds to the film's authenticity. Brian, what was it like for you watching these scenes with Paul Dano recreating well, Pet Sounds? Well, it's so factual that it scared me, you know? <laughs> I was like very am amazed by how factual and how closely they portrayed my personality and the way I produce records. In keeping with the authentic look of the film, 
Everyone's hair also appears to be natural. In fact, aside from Paul Giamatti, who is bald in real life, I couldn't spot a single wig in the entire film. This may appear to be a silly little thing, but it actually goes a really long way with me. I don't know what it is, but so many wigs in these modern biopics look so stiff and weird. You see it a lot in Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocketman, where someone has to have shoulder length hair and it just looks so unnatural. It's so set in place and has no movement to it, and honestly, really takes me out of the movie. See, it should... When you move around, it should move with you, you know? Sorry, now it just looks like a shampoo commercial. Is it starting to make sense why I care about this sort of stuff? <laughs> this is, again, another benefit of filming a specific period. You can put more time and effort in it to make it look truly authentic, including getting your actors to grow their hair to the required length. It also means that subtle changes make it feel less static and frozen in time, such as Brian's house becoming more and more bohemian and trippy after years of psychedelics, resulting in the piano sandpit in the living room, something Brian Wilson actually did in real life. In creating the two eras, there are many other thematic differences between the 60s and the 80s. For example, in the 60s, we often see Brian with many people around, whether they're left over from parties, fiddling away in the studio, or trying to talk his ear off when he takes LSD. He's always in settings where he's surrounded by people, following him like he's some sort of visionary, which in a way he was. In the 80s, Brian is almost always alone. When we meet him, he's alone in the car he wants to buy or trying to find Melinda's apartment. Even his beachfront home emphasizes his solitude. He never has friends or family with him, which is weird because it's obvious he needs the love and company now more than ever. But of course, we know he's not really alone. In fact, Brian is under constant surveillance from Landy during this period. He's got Landy's men following him wherever he goes, and Melinda acts as a way out of this. In being free with Melinda, he can at once finally be alone, but also never feel truly lonely ever again. I'll talk more a little later about how Elizabeth Banks' role as Melinda is in itself groundbreaking for the biopic formula. But first, I want to touch on what I think is the film's best quality and the key reason why it outstrips every other music biopic. Love and Mercy is the best film at showing the creative process of the artist. In creating pet sounds and good vibrations, we actually get a real sense of what it was like in the studio as Brian worked with the Wrecking Crew, the highly sought after team of hired session musicians, as they took Brian's direction and made some of the strangest, most wonderful music of all time. This starts with a very enjoyable conversation Brian has at the beginning of the film with his brothers Carl and Dennis, the band's guitarist and drummer respectively. They're talking about the Beatles' Rubber Soul and how it actually sounds like a groundbreaking, cohesive set of songs that work as a complete statement. When you hear the new Beatles, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it works like a whole. It's like a whole album. Everything fits together. No fat. Like an album of folk songs, but the sounds are really far out. Lots of overdubbing. They stole our backing vocal. You know, we go, la, 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 la. And then they change it to, we can't let them get ahead of us. I can take us further. This is in reference to the competitive streak that the Beach Boys had going with the Beatles at the time, where they made Rubber Soul, causing Brian to make pet sounds, which in turn inspired the Beatles to create Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. All right, I need to point this out now. Pet Sounds is actually my favorite album of all time. I know it probably seems a bit strange that it's not a Beatles album, but trust me, they claim spots two, three, and probably four more others in my top 10. <laughs> but there is truly something otherworldly and magical about Pet Sounds that I just think it's the best. And I know this might make this analysis seem a little bit biased, but no, think about it. I have such reverence for this album that if they put a foot wrong in depicting its creation, That'd be it. The film would be a total wash. But no, they nailed it, which just makes watching this movie an even bigger pleasure. Like these scenes in the studio are my favorite in the entire film and play out in a way where we, the audience, aren't just watching Brian at work, but on a more emotional level, we actually feel what it's like to be Brian. They're shot on handheld super 16 millimeter film cameras, which give all of these sequences a real documentary type vibe. Even the first scene before the opening credits is shot this way, where we have Brian talking in the control room about the sound he wants to create. And it really feels like we're a fly on the wall watching an outtake from a documentary and not a biopic. The music part of it worked out in my head, but I don't know anything else except that it should, it should sound like, you know, a cry, but 
sort of a good way or something. The director, Bill Pollard, even kept cinematographer Robert Yerman out of the rehearsals so that he never knew what was coming, which kept alive the improvisational nature of the scenes. With the exception of one person, the people that play the members of the Wrecking Crew aren't actually actors, but other top-notch session musicians who all played live on set, making the moments where they're rehearsing and tuning up even more authentic and real. It also meant they never had to mime to a track, but were able to recreate all the sounds in real time. These scenes also weren't really scripted, but were instead built around improvisations and direction led by Paul Dano, who meticulously studied the Pet Sounds studio sessions, many of which are just commercially available thanks to the 40th anniversary release of the album, which if you're a fan of Pet Sounds, you gotta check out. I love this use of real outtakes, demos, to help establish a genuine recreation of the time. It's something I wish music biopics utilized much, much more. They even recreated footage from the same period, such as this one of Brian bopping along to good vibrations. But notice how it doesn't go for the entire last 20 minutes of the film. <coughs> the creative process is perhaps best explored in this film as we watch the construction of the song You Still Believe In Me. We begin with Brian using bobby pins on the piano strings to get a precise sound for the opening melody. This is followed by him discussing the proper tonal quality of the bicycle horn to drummer Hal Blaine, and even included riling up the dogs to get a sample of them barking, despite that not being used in the song. We then move on to the vocals of the song, which features a technique that I just adore. When Brian has to sing his solo vocal line, what we're listening to is a meticulous blending of Brian Wilson's real vocal take with Paul Dano's, and the result sounds exactly how it should. And after all I promised you so faithfully a perfect fusion of their two voices. I really love this style of recreating vocals, as so often with biopics, you get the version where the actor is speaking in their natural voice. We could all murder each other, but then who would be left to record this album? And then you get the jarring shift to the artist's real singing voice for the song, and the two are so audibly different. I don't wanna die. Roger, there's only room in this band for one hysterical queen. Or the actor just sings all their songs in their natural voice, which sometimes works, but usually ends up with a vocal take just not living up to the person that they're portraying. This solution of blending the voices gives you a lovely balance of the two and is, once again, something that I think should be used much more often. As well as recreating the instrumental sounds with the Wrecking Crew, we also see how the Beach Boys themselves interacted during the vocal overdubs. With most of them really enjoying the new sounds, save for of course Mike Love, who, among other issues, takes umbrage with things like the possible drug references in Hang On To Your Ego, culminating in an argument between the two. I just want to know if it's a drug song. If it's not a drug song, I want to know if it's a Does it sound like a drug Song to anybody else? Okay, it's not a drug song. Is it about? I don't know. Okay, so hang on, we'll hang on to our egos. Let's all just hang on to our egos and record this one. In a scene fully reminiscent of the Beatles' "Let It Be," Mike insists that the album is just too out there and not Beach Boys enough. Why no, it's amateurish. Right. It's amateurish. No, it's not all bad. Don't get me wrong, but it's not Beach Boys fun. No, There's not one hit on this album, guys. Even the happy songs are sad. With Brian pushing back with how they need to develop their sound. That's all I'm old saying. Old stuff is old. So we'll make it new again. I can't go back in time. We're not surfers, we never have been, and real surfers don't dig our music anyway. They don't. Can't write about the summer and fun and summer and summer and fun and cars. I got different stuff inside me. I gotta get it out. You gotta get it out. Who are you, Mozart? A real argument that's sustained between the two well beyond pet sounds. Like, Brian Wilson just hates Mike Love. I don't like Mike Love at all. No. Because I don't like his, his attitude is too egotistical. Can't be around the guy. More, five minutes around him is that's all I can take. Then we have the following scene of Brian singing his melancholy solo in Caroline No, which really works as it reads as an expression of the pain he's feeling with Mike. And that's what makes so many of these studio scenes not only authentic, but earned. They all carry emotional weight, as we witness Brian's collaboration creates real emotional tension with Mike Love and his father, which I'll get to. Now, I'm not saying that all music biopics fail to include any kind of depiction of the creative process. They do. It's just so often very showy and surface level. Take, I don't know, Bohemian Rhapsody, for example. There's a few fun sequences, like the band aiming to get Roger Taylor's high notes just right, which are definitely enjoyable. But then there's the scene where Freddie Mercury is writing the lyrics to a new song, and, well... Oh, that's really good. 
You see, what are we learning about what the song actually means to Freddie Mercury? No joke, my girlfriend and I both saw this movie in the cinema and when he said that line, we both just turned to each other and burst out laughing. It's just something extremely lazy and one-dimensional about the approach that just really got to me. Contrast that again with another terrific example from Love and Mercy as we witness the song God Only Knows take shape. We first see Paul as Brian, tentatively playing it on piano, and as he continues, becomes more confident and finishes it proudly only to reveal that he was performing it for his father, who disapproves of the sound, the name, and the general direction Brian is taking with it. Frankly, if you really want to know, I don't care for it. It's too wishy-washy. If you leave me, why leave me? Life will go on, why go on living? This display of creativity is so real. Showing your art to a loved one who you deeply want to impress, but you're just getting nothing back. It's a love song. It's a suicide note. Didn't you just say it could be something with the right arrangement? There's palpable tension here as it was Brian's dad Murray who got them together as a band in the first place and managed them during their early years. However, tensions grew as Murray Wilson became more controlling and tyrannical while Brian and the boys were excelling at honing their own style, eventually having to fire their overbearing father once and for all. We then see and hear the Wrecking Crew filling out the instrumental parts of God Only Knows. <laughs> Brian watches enthusiastically from the control panel. Finally, we hear the song as it sounds in Brian's mind, while he gazes at the stars, complete with ethereal voices and cosmic harmonies. reaching a spiritual crescendo before Hal interrupts him. He tells him that despite working with the likes of Sinatra, Phil Spector and Elvis, Brian's music is nothing like he's heard before. I'm blowing our minds. So despite not getting the approval from his father, the validation he gets from the other musicians is actually what gets him through. Brian's dad returns again in the Caroline No recording, where he interrupts the process to play them a song by a new band he's managing. This is what you guys need to get back to. This is a hit. This causes Brian to manifest many dark emotions as he's trying to record one of his most vulnerable songs and instead when he puts the headphones back on we get an eerie, twisted collection of sounds that act as another audible window into Brian's mind. Which brings me to another brilliant feature of this movie, its relationship to sound. Atticus Ross, the legendary co-composer of soundtracks to films like The Social Network, flew solo this time without his usual collaborator Trent Reznor. Ross's work on the film, along with the sound designer and engineer, is brilliant, as he not only incorporates the music of the Beach Boys, but creates intricate soundscapes that are all ways in which our protagonist hears the world around him. Right after the candid shot of Brian talking in the studio which opens the film, we then get a full 1 minute and 19 seconds of a black screen, along with what Atticus Ross calls a black hole of sound. This collection of samples from old Beach Boy songs, studio sessions, interviews, and Ross's own composition combine in a way that is meant to depict the inner workings of Brian's volatile and brilliant mind. It's a way of introducing the central theme of the film, which is, in fact, sound. Not just the sound that Brian hears in his mind, or the new sound he wants to create for pet sounds, but how sound in general has impacted him in a deep way throughout his life. There's a scene where Brian's on a double date with Melinda and the guy supervising him. Brian tells this story, which is taken directly from an interview with the real Brian, about the times that his father beat him and his brothers. Now, in a traditional biopic, this would just be recreated with a child actor and a flashback. But in Love and Mercy, we hear it as an anecdote from the older Brian, which may seem less exciting, but it's the way that John Cusack describes not the pain, not the humiliation, but the sound of the beatings. There's a spanking, you know, a certain kind of spanking. And it sounds like, uh, you know, like, by the way we had it. The way it came out of him is, you know, really hard. The sound of his father vocalizing the physical abuse is what's stuck with him, and it's a way that Melinda can start to see why Brian is such a tortured person. And it's also a leading theory as to why Brian is 90% deaf in his right ear. Another example is the dinner party scene celebrating the release of Good Vibrations. After some small talk at the table, the sound of silverware and glasses begins to form a clinking rhythm and gets louder and louder until Brian can't take it anymore. It's a way of showing the audience both how Brian's unique genius could make music out of silverware or chompy on vegetables, as is actually depicted in the song Vegetables from Smiley Smile. Tried to kick the ball, 
but, my but also how that same tendency started to lead to his mental health decline, as the pressure from the time period, along with his regular LSD consumption, began wreaking havoc on his mind. I gotta say, this scene where he takes LSD for the first time is one of my favourite portrayals of the drug in film. Without going over the top, it shows Brian going further inside himself, along with these flowers sprouting and this beautiful sunset, followed by a wonderfully innocent performance from Paul Dano talking to his wife at the time. <laughs> Man, Paul Dano. This guy just doesn't get enough credit. He consistently delivers world-class performances, but he's never talked about in the same leagues as other actors that are nowhere near as talented. In Love and Mercy, he gives the performance of his life. He's so much like Brian Wilson, from the physical awkwardness to the near pitch-perfect vocal portrayal. I heard the word, wonderful thing, a children's song. both when he's singing and talking. It's like being blind, but because you're blind, you can see more. Don't you think it's a spiritual kind of thing? I love music and I get very inspired, just generally creative anywhere, right. you know, and I, I just understand. do it all the time. He also carries the emotional weight of the complicated relationship with his father, the other Beach Boys, and emanates Brian's gentle humility, despite being one of the greatest musical talents of all time. This performance is matched beautifully with John Cusack's portrayal of the older Brian. Think about it, this guy had to play someone who spent three years in bed in one of the the worst physical and mental conditions you can be in as a human being. And you can see it. You can see years of abuse, neglect, and anguish in the way he plays Brian, but at the same time, you also see the innocent kindness that attracts Melinda to him. His voice and gait are small and unsure. In some ways, I love my dad, you know, because he scared me and he scared me so much, I think he actually scared me into making good records. He feels trapped in his own body because in a way he really was. This is a credit to the way the film was directed too. Cusack's depiction of Brian isn't coming from someone who's trying to play the schizoaffective disorder. It's a portrayal of Brian Wilson after having talked to the real man, been with him, got his side of the story, and shows a thoughtful collaboration between director, actor, and subject matter. There's a great continuity about the way in which both Dano and Cusack approach the role that serves the character and film much more than a shallow performance based more on physical resemblance. Paul Dano and John Cusack didn't interact or trade notes on their portrayals throughout the entire filming process. Before filming started, each of them got to meet the real Brian a few times and both took note of the way in which the man would talk, behave, respond to their questions, and then built their own character from those interactions, giving the two performances a through line whilst also allowing them to stand out on their own. One actor couldn't really capture a whole human life. By having two actors do it, we sort of are admitting that it's only going to be reflections or fractions of him. A key component of this film's success is getting the blessing and trust of Brian and Melinda to allow the creators to make the film how it needed to be made. Brian Wilson was closely involved with the project, and usually when an artist has direct involvement in the portrayal and story, you're getting the most flattering portrayal of that person, which can often produce a heavily biased result. But Brian Wilson, a man who wasn't typically concerned with ego or appearance, was insistent that the filmmakers show the true Brian Wilson, even the uncomfortable parts. He doesn't have a lot of ego, so he's not like trying to say, oh, you know, make me this way, or he just doesn't come into his mind. I think this is another key feature of why this film works so well. It has heavy involvement from the source material, meaning that it will be both respectful and incisive, but has also allowed the freedom to create an artistic statement of its own without falling into the deep hole of fan service. I've also got to give it up to Paul Giamatti and his portrayal of the caustic Eugene Landy. Just continuing a great streak of playing arseholes who managed musicians. So the real Brian Wilson reportedly had a bit of a disassociative experience while watching the film. He started to believe that Paul Giamatti was the actual Eugene Landy and felt, quote, absolutely in fear for several minutes. And finally, we have Elizabeth Banks as Melinda Ledbetter, who just really shines in this film. The 60s sequences are shown through Brian's eyes, but in the 80s, because Brian at this time is so damaged and passive with very little agency of his own, we're really seeing this period through Melinda's eyes. I mean, she's the first person that we see from this time period, not Brian. Her bearing witness to Landy's mental and emotional abuse of Brian drives the action of the latter half of the film where she works towards freeing him, even when it puts her in danger. This is such a welcome narrative change. In far too many music biopics, the wife of the genius male musician is often sidelined as a one-note character who's usually stuck with the kids and grows resentful of the artist. Not here though, as Elizabeth Banks gives us an incredibly grounded and sympathetic performance as Melinda. Even the depiction of Brian's first wife is done lovingly, and though the actress is 
isn't given much to do, she definitely has fun with the role and isn't shown to be some suffering spouse who can't stand her husband. I could go on and on with all the ways that I think this movie is a complete triumph. But after re-watching it, I found a scene that perfectly sums up its success as a music biopic. Brian's working out the instrumental arrangement on Wouldn't It Be Nice, and Carol Kay, the bass player of The Wrecking Crew, stops in to point out a mistake. Well, you've got Lyle playing in D, and the rest of us are in A major. Yeah, that's right. How does that work? Two bass lines in two different keys? Well, it works in my head. And that's Love and Mercy. Two different bass lines playing in two different keys. Two different Brian's in two different periods that somehow works. And how it works in his head is now what we see and hear on screen. The Brian Wilson that exists after Love and Mercy is now one that we have a much fuller and richer depiction of. We now understand the human being behind the greatest album of all time. We also understand the trapped and damaged figure the world nearly forgot but was saved by the person who gave him the love he deserved and the mercy he desperately needed. It's why the movie isn't just called Brian or something like that. Its full title is Love and Mercy, the lives, times and music of Brian Wilson reimagined. It's what all music biopics and biopics in general should be a reimagining of a person's life. Something that doesn't just point out the hits, but reimagines what made them beloved and unique in the first place. I don't own many physical copies of movies anymore, but I did get the Blu-ray of this film for no other reason than I just think it deserves to take up physical space in my life. I also have the physical copy of Brian Wilson's self-titled LP because of course the opening track is Love and Mercy where this film gets its name. You'll hear that song in the credits, it makes it pretty obvious. And I know I've said this before, but could you imagine if we got to see something similar, but with the Beatles' Sgt. Peppers? Or just any Beatles album, any, just someone do a decent portrayal of the Beatles' creative process. I'm just, please. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching the full video. And hey, I'd love to know what you thought of this film. Is it also your favorite music biopic? If it is, drop a like. And if not, let me know in the comments what is. And if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and subscribe. I'm really trying to get my numbers up. But otherwise, thanks again, everyone. And I will see you in the next one.